short uh, uh, introduction about the legal framework. I'm not a lawyer, it's just, just a consultant, but just to give you an idea. Uh, foreign exchange trading uh, is uh, legal if it is offered uh, by Chinese banks. Uh, in a sense, anyone, uh, Chinese or foreign, can go to the Bank of China or ICBC and you can open your own uh, uh, foreign uh, trading account. Um, uh, local brokers cannot, not even local licensed uh, brokers. Um, and no one else can. Uh, if we speak about leverage for exchange trading, then in this case no one can, not even uh, Chinese banks, at least now, then maybe uh, tomorrow they, they, will, uh, they will change the, the rules. Um, uh, now, in terms of uh, um, uh, working in China, of course, as we know, many forex brokers enter, enter China. It is possible to operate in a kind of uh, gray area in the sense that uh, Chinese authorities know what is going on uh, and they, they tolerate it as long as the brokers uh, follow certain rules. Um, so, for example, uh, the, I, I always say the first rule is uh, never accept money in China and the second rule is never accept money in China. So if you, if you, uh, if you deal with, uh, with China, whatever your setup is, you will sign the agreement with the clients from abroad, from your regulated uh, counterparty abroad. You will get the funds there either directly or through the payment processor. Never set up uh, entities to receive in local bank accounts or other kind of structure because you are going to end up six months, to, to, to last six months. Um, uh, other rules, of course, is uh, treat your customers fairly uh, because uh, that means also less complaints, so uh, being less under the scope of the uh, authorities. And um, uh, do not allow your employee to uh, do what they're not allowed in your headquarters, so no money management. I mean, you can let your IBs do it and so on, but do not let absolutely your employees do, do that. There are many other rules, but just uh, these are uh, some, some simple rules. Uh, it is perfectly possible and actually I think it's a must to um, uh, have an office in China, uh, sales, uh, customer support, marketing, maybe analyst and instructions in, uh, in China without uh, running a uh, risk in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in the local office but not even for the headquarters, at least no relevant risk. Uh, I, I would say have Guangzhou. <laughs> so, um, Obviously, lo local people on the ground, uh, a network of IBs, um, I think you brought up a, a great point of treat your clients fairly. Yeah, I, I think we've seen, um, in, in the news, everyone's seen brokers over there who've had clients storm their offices or, or protest outside. So, um, have, have people on the ground, uh, have people who are experienced and, and have connections in that market and behave yourself. Yeah, yeah, great points. Uh, look, I think part of the reason we've had such good growth and success in China is our ability to analyze and quarantine the risks uh, that there are entering that market. And look, there are a few, and you raised them quite aptly and, and articulated them very well. But just to add to that, uh, I think you know you really got to hammer the point that you've got to ensure that as a regulated entity, you're covered uh, to accept the foreign clients. But then when you go into the Chinese market, you have to make it clear what you're there for. And if you establish your physical presence correctly, it should be, as you said, just an advisory office and, and the provision of information and customer support, which is very important and that's all part of providing a good service. Uh, brokers without a physical presence in China, like you said, uh, you're really not doing yourself justice because it's good to have that first level of support uh, in their local language, someone they can trust, an account manager. So, for example, uh, every client that signs up with us has a personal account manager, which is their first line of support. And I think that's just paramount, and absolutely fundamentally important to running a successful business in that sense. So how do you exactly set up a, an office in China and under what uh, legal um, framework? Like meaning it's it's not allowed to be a broker, so what is it exactly? Oh, uh, Eugene, this is your business. Okay. Kind of business. <laughs> Okay, so um, most uh, most biotech brokers uh, usually set up uh, in uh, um, in uh, Shanghai or Shenzhen. Uh, when we speak about office in China, we speak about mainland China. Hong Kong uh, doesn't count uh, because uh, uh, you set up an office uh, uh, to make it easy for the clients to, to visit you. 
so most of our clients uh, set up in, uh, in Shanghai or uh, Shenzhen. Uh, for example, in the case of Shanghai, one popular district is uh, uh, the Huangpu district. In the Huangpu district, uh, uh, we um, usually have to set up Kofi, uh, uh, which is basically a consultancy company. Which is just a, a private limited company in order to uh, hire the employees, uh, and, uh, and that's all you that's all you have to do. Um, in order to set up, uh, once all documents are provided in, in good order, it takes uh, it takes around two months. Uh, but the thing is, even before you start the application, you need to lease an office uh, for at least twelve months. Uh, it can be either a real office or a serviced office, uh, but uh, virtual office uh, uh, is, not a, is not a good idea. You, you, you can pass through, but then you will have troubles later. Uh, so that is the let's say, main thing that is a little annoying. Uh, but then you, you start the application, after a couple of months you get uh, your uh, company, you get a local bank account, which again you cannot use to accept uh, uh, clients' funds. And, uh, and um, uh, there is a minimum capital. There is no, the law does not uh, say what is the exact uh, capital, but I can tell you that uh, uh, if you uh, can put 70,000 US dollars in registered capital, uh, you have 99% chances to get uh, approved. Uh, you do not even have to pay in. You can take your sweet time, even two years, to put the money in. But this said, uh, usually our clients uh, uh, prefer to put more and immediately because this brings to a series of advantages in terms of taxes, but I will not go through, 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 through this now. Um, yeah, and, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's really, in, in terms of uh, maybe, uh, I mean, why, maybe to explain why, why it's, good, um, it's good to have an office, because uh, clients can visit you, IVs can visit you, uh, uh, most of them, of course, will not. But the thing is just the fact that they, they know that they can visit you if uh, they need. That is the important thing. That will affect your branding, your reputation. That will let you have more uh, control on the local market, more understanding, which means less risk, more profitability. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very important. You can also deal better conditions with, uh, with, uh, with the IPs. So it's, uh, it's, I, I believe it's very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Just to expand on that a little bit. It's it comes down to one of the fundamental things which I mentioned earlier, which is trust. And if you don't trust your broker, uh, then there is no real relationship there and there's no benefit. So an element of that trust is a physical presence and, and you're accountable to these clients if you have a physical presence. They can come to you if there's anything wrong, but it comes back to that fair dealing, best practice, and overall just doing the right thing in the right environment to make sure that you are quarantining your own risks. Just to answer that, it's not, not really an area of my specialty, but I know um, one of the popular strategies in the past is to set up a, a joint venture with an existing IB. So a broker who, who had a brand in, in, in Australia would, would find an IB, let them use their name, and, and tack onto their existing company registration and, and offers local knowledge. If I can say a word about this, usually, I'm sorry to say, but I usually always advise my clients not to do that because uh, uh, from my experience it never ended up uh, uh, well in the sense that uh, after you get an office uh, you usually, um, usually you also look for good people and, uh, and uh, most of the time these people are people who come already they were employees in the, in, the, in the industry there are many brokers that approach us and say ah, okay you know, I will see if I get an office in the meantime I will get uh, a very large IP and then uh, we will see, uh, we, if uh, he said that he will bring us a lot of money and then uh, we will just fund this office and uh, with the marketing, uh, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, even uh, if uh, the, bring the business comes, then after a while there have been examples, I will not make names, but uh, in many people know of uh, brokers that have been locked out from their own offices uh, because uh, it was set up uh, by, uh, by, of course I'm not saying that uh, all, uh, all IBs uh, do, do this, but uh, of course uh, you, uh, if you are doing this, it means you do not know the person you are dealing with, because instead if you have an office first, then you get to know the IBs, and maybe later you can ask this ID to set up a satellite office for you, and so on, but first you need to have uh, your own understanding of the market. In the same way, when uh, I, when the office is, uh, is set up and you hire uh, your country manager or head of sales and so on, I usually always advise to send someone from the headquarters to Shanghai for at least six months. It doesn't matter how much the head of sales is, um, uh, is, is, is competent, 
but he will still need to understand uh, what are the internal policies or how to communicate within the company. I need this, who do I speak to? So, and th when you get lost in translation, the company loses money, the, the head of sales gets demotivated because they say, okay, they, they really don't understand how important China is. And then there is the, the, the time zone difference and, and so on. So it's very important to start uh, well, in, in the right way. Just check if there are already uh, questions from the audience. Please, Karen. You can talk a little bit. I'm, I'm not very. Uh, uh, second ring. Right. Uh, if you can talk a little bit about uh, regulation in Switzerland. Uh, okay, frankly speaking, I've not been dealing uh, with uh, clients uh, from uh, from Switzerland. I know that there are uh, there are uh, um, uh, uh, a few, uh, so I, they are not, not my clients. So I don't know what are the uh, compliance uh, requests from uh, from Switzerland, for example. How tight the compliance is? Um, of course, uh, let's say that uh, in, from from what I know, in the mind of Chinese, Switzerland is more a country for uh, money management asset management, so they respect that. Uh, in terms of uh, brokerage, there are a few companies, uh, Swiss Golds and, and others that, uh, that uh, are, uh, are, uh, are known, but, uh, but um, practically speaking, I don't know. If I'm not wrong, but I don't, I, as I said, I don't know. In Switzerland, in order to get a license, uh, you need to uh, obtain a banking license uh, if you want to do effects, but if someone can correct me, but I'm, yeah. He's correct, yeah. I'm, Again, I'm, I know he's a bit about, about Switzerland, but there are uh, um, a couple of things I know. They, they are rolling out a trade reporting regime, similar, similar to what um, goes on in, in, in ASIC and, um, and the EEA. Um, also, I, I used to deal with a Swiss-based broker, uh, and I know their compliance and account opening procedures were, were very difficult. From memory, I think people had to send in original ID documents to open an account with a, with a Swiss broker. That was yeah, I think just to elaborate on that a little bit, it's actually evolved to a stage now and again. I'm no expert in Swiss regulation, but uh, the KYC is, is at that higher standard where now uh, you can't even send the ID. You actually have to do a video interview with your passport to show that it is you, and you are the ones doing the document. So, I mean, those higher standards, it, it's sort of a double edged sword, right? You, you really need to have that strong compliance culture, but you can't have it to the point where you won't get sales. So it is, it's a bit of a balancing act, and I think other jurisdictions are perhaps handling it a little bit better, allowing businesses to still know their client, but also ensure the sales process is efficient and it's not too difficult to onboard and, and you know, ascertain clients. China is not a place where you go there and you taste the water. Either you swim or you stay out of the water. So uh, the, the, the thing is, you, 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 you get an office, you deal uh, with the IVs, you can uh, do uh, marketing. Okay, about marketing, that will be uh, a lot to say as well, because there have been recently a lot of uh, policy changes that we need much harder. But uh, um, uh, dealing with, with IVs, usually the, the contract with IVs is signed, uh, uh, usually it, it, it is signed, it's, of course you, you try not to sign it with the local office in China, but uh, I know that many brokers also do not use the regulated entity because uh, from a uh, money reconciliation point of view, it might be hard to pay from the, from the regulated entity, so sometimes they go through other, uh, uh, through, through other ways. Uh, I'm not sure if I answer all your questions. Uh, uh, was <laughs> so, um, when, 
when I was the general manager at Axi Trader, we had a lot of IBs out of China. Um, and the way we, we got them was attending expos. So I think the first one we did was probably 2009 in, in Shenzhen. Um, and there was only two, uh, two Australian brokers there. So we, we, we made a lot of contacts there. Um, Shanghai Money Fair is, is a massive one. Uh, so that's that's a good place to start. Get on the ground. Obviously, all the IBs are going to be there. Have a stand at the expo if you can. Um, also, clients often turn into into great IB, IB service your clients. Look after them well. Have good customer support. Then they'll trust you, like your products, and, and they'll be able to, to sell them to other people that have you from them. Yeah. Uh, look, I can talk from our personal experience as a business without obviously giving away the whole game, but. Um, I think you nailed it on the head. You create a culture and you create a company image um, and then the people will come to you. So you want to create this image of a, of a trustworthy broker, someone of integrity. So for example, at the last Shanghai Money Fair, which had about 85,000 people attend, uh, coming through with institutional investors, retail investors, everybody was walking through. A lot of brokers had uh, their regulation and their certificate printed in a trophy case, you know, almost like it is a trophy to be regulated. Uh, our approach was a little bit different, so we actually went down the line of uh, showcasing the partnerships with the clients we'd ascertained. So, uh, for example, we'd uh, done a strategic relationship with Tune Group, who is a public listed entity, and uh, also a hedge fund in Australia. So that, that was our method of approaching the market. So the message is this, you know, if we're dealing at, at this high level with public listed companies, hedge funds, and you know, that the retail investor should have faith and show faith. And then that in turn will attract people who want to bring business to you because they want to get involved. So you create this, uh, this symbiosis, this synergy of a good culture and it will attract them and magnetize them to, you know, grow your business because they'll grow with you. Thank you for your question. Hi. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, we have a forex broker. Uh, 